not one, but two goal scorer on the weekend. Tom Haneman joins us. Tom, welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on the show. Pleasure's all mine, Tom. What a game. What a night. History was made in Ottawa. The fans were outstanding. They packed them in there. Your two goals ignited your squad to reach to the finals. Run us through the emotions. Run us through uh, the feelings uh, during the game, after the game, and after it really soaked in even 24 hours when you were at home at Lone uh, on the day after. You know, it, it was really... Uh... It was really a complete performance from the team. You know, uh, we had to face a little bit of adversity early on. Had a couple chances that that didn't drop for us. Their their goalkeeper in Jock uh, made some incredible saves, and um, you know it was a game where you start to you start to think, oh no, are these chances going to come back to haunt us? And uh, then you go down one nothing on a on a very uh, controversial penal- penalty decision, and um, you know at halftime we. Um, we just kind of took a deep breath, kind of gathered our emotions, and, and Mark said, hey, keep doing the same thing you're doing because we're, we're absolutely dominating the, the possession and the flow of the game. So we did that. We stuck to our game plan, and I tell you what, uh, this group of guys is, in their commitment to, to a game plan, it's a special group. Tom, it's a veteran group. It's a group that doesn't need to be told very much. As you said at halftime, obviously Coach Mark Dos Santos spoke up, but I'm sure wonderful leaders like Julian de Guzman and others uh, said their piece to make everyone understand, to relax, calm down, focus. We know what needs to take place. Let's just go out there and do it, correct? Correct. There's a, there's a group of guys that, that have... Uh, Put in, uh, put in the paces in their in their career, and worked hard to get to get to to where we are, and um, and have also been there and done that. So there's a quiet, calm confidence about about the group uh, at halftime, and, and uh, we we've been in that situation before, and, and we were confident that we we could uh, we could overcome uh, the the little bit of adversity that we faced early on. Tom, talk about some of the guys on the squad that don't get enough publicity, don't get enough respect around the league. Guys that they know in this city of Toronto quite well. Andrew Wienemann, Ryan Richter. These guys come with their lunch buckets. They come with their hard hats and they come to work each and every game. They've done it all season long. These, to me, are important pieces to the puzzle, uh, especially going up against the Cosmos. Definitely, definitely. It takes uh, it takes all eleven players uh, on the field, and, and Ryan's had a fantastic season. Played every single minute. Uh, Andrews come come in and uh, scored a bunch of critical goals for us uh, um, as we kind of went down the final stretch here. And uh, even a guy like Mason Trafford, you know, who uh, was out of the team at the beginning of the the season and, and fought his way back in, and then you know we go on this incredible run. It's guys that. Um, you know, work every single day hard, and, and we need we need all 11 players, every single one of them. Tom, it had to be special going back to seeing that uh, record crowd in Ottawa. It looked like to me for the first time, I hate to say it, but I felt this way, that soccer finally arrived in the nation's capital. It's got a wonderful, rich history in youth clubs, some of the biggest in Canada. They're doing some special things with some of their youth clubs out there. But for the first time, I believe they all stepped up to the plate and they said, let's put our differences aside, let's go support this squad they're doing something special. That must have felt great for you and the whole squad there. You know, I'll, I'll tell you this. It, it's pretty special. Um, I like to work with youth and, and coach and, and help, uh, you know, develop players and coach players. And, and it's something special to see out, to see kids come out and to be able to, to have the vision right then and there to see the, a clear pathway to, to accomplishing their dreams. A lot of kids, uh, um, as young ones have have dreams to aspire to to play professionally and whether it be you know whatever sport it may be but to, for those that aspire to play pro soccer to come out and see it firsthand it's truly truly special and to be a part of that i mean the, the crowd was raucous it was um i said the other day that um there might have been more at our at our td place home opener but it felt like it felt like there was about twenty thousand there on sunday Tom, the NASL is growing in my mind in leaps and bounds. It's starting to, uh, slowly but surely, starting to knock on the door of MLS and say, hey, we're here, we're not leaving, and we're going to make a lot of noise. Obviously, some teams are being added in the following season, some big names coming on board, some former international guys uh, down in Miami, as we know, on and on. I think things are starting to really, uh, starting to 
you know, get that talk up again from, uh, you know, relegation, promotion, and I think the NASL needs to be part of this with MLS. What's your thoughts on that? I do. I, th I think just because of infrastructure and how things have gone, it, it might take a little longer than we like, but I think the, the conversation has definitely started. I think that the NASL is a, a fantastic league. Um, I've now been a part of it for about for three years of my career total, and um, to see the the amount of of just passion that that owners are starting to put into their clubs and uh, starting to to really invest more and, and take um, take the game that much seriously, you're starting to see it pay dividends on the field. The quality of soccer you're starting to see is is a much higher level, and um, I think that promotion relegation is. I think it's it's possible. I think it's uh, still a little bit ways off, like I said, because of the infrastructure. But it's definitely uh, it's definitely growing, and it's a fun league to be a part of right now. Tom, you mentioned just a few minutes ago you like working with the youth, and you like uh, helping when you got uh, time and an opportunity to do so. And that's great for you to do that because we need people like you giving back to the community and helping out the young kids. I think that's fantastic. Let me ask you this. This came down yesterday, I believe, and it's the talk all over the U.S. of A. It started to creep up here in Canada, and it's, uh, it's a, a ruling that came down in the courts of no heading for players 10 and under, a very limited heading for the ages of 11 to 13. Do you agree with this? Do you disagree? Apparently, you know, uh, there's, there was a lot of concern of brain damage and concussions on and on. You know, it's a, it's a good question. I actually just heard news uh, about that this morning. So um, you're talking to a guy that heads the ball quite often. So it was a little bit, uh, you know, surprising to hear that. Um, I know uh, there have been a lot of efforts to reduce the amount of contact to the head, uh, not just in uh, soccer, but, you, you know, you see it in the NFL too. I think sports are starting to uh, take that very seriously uh, in terms of head injuries because you start to get a lot of analysis and studies done that, that are that are showing, um, you know, whether it be lifespan or, or whatnot. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I, I I'm still mulling it over. I, I thought to myself when I heard that, I'm like, I don't know how I feel about that. It's a it's a tough one because um, I'm a firm advocate in, in heading the ball properly. I teach kids to head the ball properly because I think a lot of a lot of heading issues come come from heading the ball uh, improperly. Uh, to be honest with you, but I, I think the the age is for, is what I heard. I think it's eleven, isn't it? That they can't head the ball until they're eleven. Yeah, I mean it, it's basically ten and under, no heading at all, and then it says from the ages of eleven to thirteen, very limited heading. Yeah, I think that you know, from from my experience, it, you know, there's not a, a ton of heading until that age, anyways. Um, but now, kind of putting the stamp on it and the rule formalizes a little. It, it slightly and kind of uh, brings it to, to debate that much more. Um, I think it's I think it's important. You know, health health is an important it's an important part of of athletes, and and I think that um, you see all over sport that that health is a pri is a priority. Tom, let me ask you uh, let me ask you this then, Tom. Uh, you know, developing that young player in North America today is becoming more and more complicated because a lot of people feel they have the answers. A lot of people feel they have the special ingredient or the right academy or right club, on and on. And I think a lot of people are doing damage instead of good for the game in North America in a lot of different ways. Let me get your thoughts on where I still believe in Europe and in South America, there are leaps and bounds ahead of us in North America. And that's in, in simple situations where I feel that, you know, the youngsters are forced into playing uh, games at an early age. Coaches are under pressure at the youth level not to lose players so they feel the best team they can so they can win tournaments and trophies on and on. And it's a, it's a vicious circle. If I gave you, Tom, uh, an opportunity to, to change things, not just in the U.S. of A., but in Canada, what would a couple of those things be for, for the youngsters to benefit them and the coaches? You know, one of the things that I've seen in North America that I like is, is what I spoke on earlier is, is the pathway uh, to a first team. You know, I know there's a lot of animosity between clubs in a lot of cities that I've been in um, when, when uh, clubs plucking players and, uh, you know, taking from this structure and that structure, trying to develop, you know, you got one club trying to develop the right team and, and one club trying to make money. And, you know, when, when those visions align is where I think we'll, we'll see success. Um, I think you see in other countries, as you were speaking of, that the the vision is the same. The vision is to to go into a club to develop a player technically, tactically, to be able to 
to work with a player so that he can be input into a system that ultimately uh, is is the first teams. And I think that that until we get a consistent um, a consistent vision and infrastructure in that regard, I think we're gonna we're gonna you know still struggle a little bit. Let me ask you this then, Tom. That would be one thing that I would say. Well, that, that's outstanding. I'll ask you this, Tom. I had the head coach of TFC, Greg Vanion, uh, a couple weeks before his playoff game. And uh, to talk to your point, we were talking about uh, some of this. And I still, for the life of me, don't understand, specifically here in the city of Toronto, there's a lot of friction still, a lot of turmoil, a lot of hesitant of parents to send their kids to TFC, youth coaches, TDs, to be part of that. And I've always said this, if my son was ever good enough and if he's still good enough playing and TFC would come knocking on our door and say, hey, we want your son, I think I would be proud father and my son would jump at that opportunity. But we don't see that happening. Is that the same in Ottawa, do you feel? Um, you know, the, the club here in Ottawa has kind of reshaped the last uh, year and, and really taken its academy a lot more seriously. I could probably speak uh, more firsthand in my experience with the Columbus crew. I was a... Uh, I was an academy coach for, for their 98 and 99s um, in 2012, and, and they, would do, they would do the same. And, and I think that the kids in, the, in that city did, they did feel a sense of pride, um, and they were starting to do that. But, they're, they're, you know, until, like I said, until we all get on the same page in terms of vision, it's going to be difficult because it's tough for clubs to go and to, to extend an invite to a kid when there is uh, provincial uh, – you know, regulations and, and lines that you can't step over to do certain things. You know, it's going to be it's going to be difficult to to accomplish what we want until the vision is aligned. Tom, just before we let you go, we really appreciate your time. We wish you nothing but success in this massive game for yourself, uh, for the city of Ottawa, and for all the country of Canada who are backing you in, in many, many ways by tuning in and getting ready to watch that big game against the Cosmos. Let's talk about the Cosmos and the game plan. Obviously, you can't go run and gun with them because they're a high-powered offensive team. As Coach Mark DeSantos explained to you guys that you've got to keep things really, really uh, um, you know, short and, and, and quick uh, little bursts and, and make sure all, all attention to detail is there? Hey, I appreciate your support, uh, first off, from what you said. It, mean, it means a lot to me. I know it'll mean, it means a lot to the group. Uh, we definitely feel um, we feel the, the country behind us, and, and we'll, uh, we'll be looking to get the job done on, on Sunday. And, and to speak to the Cosmos, you know, they're, they're an incredible group um, of players. They've done... Um, you know, great things this year. We, we're very familiar with them, though. You know, you you play a team three times. And we're very familiar with with their players, with their lineup, with uh, their strengths, their weaknesses, and, um, and and for us, you know, to to go down there, kind of on the streak that we are, we're we've always been of the mantra that that we have a very uh, entrenched model of play that that our staffs built into us, and you know, it's been it's been working for us all season. So. Why would we change it? Um, I think that's kind of our focus as we prepare this week to, to tighten up a couple screws uh, to make sure we're aware of the threats and uh, make sure that, that we are um, defensively sound in, in, in our shape and, and, and we'll look to, uh, to exploit some key, er key areas uh, offensively. Tom, as I said, good luck. As I said, the country's behind you. A lot of people are excited for the Ottawa Fury. What a great story. Congratulations to you and all your teammates. Uh, the story isn't ended yet. And great work by the owner, John Pugh, and everyone there, Graham Ivory. Uh, really happy to see this great story, the Ottawa Fury, get to the final. And some great Canadian talent on there, like Drew Becky, uh, Julian de Guzman, on and on. It's a great story. Finish it off. We wish you again nothing but success, and we really appreciate you taking time to join us tonight, Tom. Hey, no problem. I appreciate that a lot. We'll, we'll hope to bring back the cup. Good luck. That is Tom Hanneman of the Ottawa Fury. Great having him on, and we wish him nothing but success.